Good morning, and a very warm welcome to any visitors who are joining us today here in Presswick St. Nicholas, and to friends who are watching us online, wherever you are today, welcome, and we hope you feel very much at home sharing our worship here in Presswick. Our thanks are due and very certainly given to Mr. Alan Richmond of Alloway Parish Church, who is deputising at the organ during Isabel's holiday. We're very grateful to Alan. He's no stranger here to St. Nicholas, and he played at Nina's funeral the other day, and we're very grateful to him for playing at both services this morning. I received a lovely card from one of the couples whose baby was baptised a fortnight ago, and it's to the congregation of St. Nicholas. Dear everyone at St. Nicholas, thank you ever so much for the extremely warm welcome that you gave to us and our family and friends on the occasion of Jensen's baptism on Sunday the 25th of July 2021. We are very much looking forward to bringing Jensen, once creche and Sunday school, resume in person. Also many thanks for Jensen's Bible, certificate, cards and the beautiful flowers. Love Gary, Wendy and Jensen and three kisses. That is lovely and delightful. How thoughtful that a mum took the time to send that. The service of thanksgiving for Mrs. Monica Tracy will be held here in church on Thursday 1st at 11.15 when COVID restrictions will still be in place. If you would like to pay your respects to Monica's family and to honour her life, you're invited to stand on the church grounds from 11 o'clock onwards. The service of committal will be held prior to the service of thanksgiving. And it's with great sadness that we intimate the death of one of our senior elders, Mr. Peter Gardner, who passed away in Air Hospital last week. Peter was a most committed office bearer and a faithful attender all during the months of restrictions and indeed was at church two Sundays ago. The provisional arrangements for his funeral are a service here in the church on Monday the 16th of March at 10.15, followed by the service of committal at Mason Hill at 11.15, and we pray for his daughters and their families. Our prayerful support is extended to the family of Mrs. Euphemia Horsborough, who passed away in Templeton House Air last week, aged 100. The funeral service for Mrs. Horsborough, formerly of Presswick, will be held at Mason Hill on Wednesday 1st, the 11th of August at 9.45 a.m. And we remember her nephew and niece and the family. As from tomorrow, Monday the 9th of August, all restrictions and numbers at funeral services at Mason Hill Crematorium have been lifted by South Ayrshire. And so there's no limit to the number of those who are able to attend the services in the crematorium as from tomorrow. But masks must be worn at all times. But we're delighted that the restrictions have been lifted and there is no limit because for the past several months it's been 40, but now there's no limit to the number who are able to be here. But the number allowed in churches by the Church of Scotland is still restricted until further notice at, for funeral services. These are all our intimations. This is the time and this is the place where God waits to break into our experience. This is the time and this is the place where heaven's doors are open to us. Let us worship God. We sing the first hymn in our order of service. Father, I place into your hands the things that I can't do.
Let us pray. Astounding God, radiant Redeemer, strengthening Spirit, we do indeed want to place ourselves into your almighty hands, to feel your fatherly embrace as you heal us and calm us. And so we've turned our steps to this holy space this morning. For this building radiates your peace. The gathering of your people affirms our worth. The time of worship sets us on our feet for the week ahead. You've brought us in safety to this present day, guiding our footsteps, allaying our fears, empowering us to cope with all of life's demands and its hurts. Heavenly Father, we praise you. So quiet here, away from the pressures and the tensions of our daily living. Outside, the world rushes on its way, but within these walls, we can stop and catch our breath and get our bearings. Here, your word is spoken, strong and sure. Here, your praises are sung, defying fear and strife. Now, Christ's outstretched hands rest upon us in blessing. Heavenly Father, we praise you. Cradle us in our vulnerability, Lord. Unite us as your family. Forgive us for all the ways in which we've let you down. And we ask that your love will wash over us like the waves lapping over the pebbles on the beach, smoothing our rough edges, taking away the jaggedness of our sins, leaving something beautiful for your glory. This time is yours, O oh God, and so are we. Work within us and among us so that we may see Christ's resurrection life in our living, in our time and in our world. These prayers and our earnest worship we present in his precious name. Amen. We hear God's word in the scriptures of the Old Testament in the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 19 and reading from verse 4. Let us hear the word of God. In fear, Elijah fled for his life. And when he reached Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, and sitting down under it, he prayed for death. It is enough, he said, now, Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my fathers before me. He lay down under the bush, and while he slept, an angel touched him and said, rise and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a pitcher of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again and touched him in a second time, saying, Rise and eat, the journey is too much for you. He rose and ate and drank, and sustained by this food, he went on for forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he entered a cave where he spent the night. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Past, present, and future God, with whom the poorest service becomes instinct with life, and the most stammering tongues can speak plainly, be with us now as we unfold your ancient holy word to us, that the joy of the Lord may fill our hearts and the peace of the Lord may fill every fiber of our being. Through Jesus Christ we ask it. Amen. One of the reasons that I love the scriptures and the Bible so much is that it is not afraid of the truth even the sometimes fairly sordid truth about its heroes and heroines. Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, called by God from the ancient city of Ur and the Chaldees to go in search of a new land. Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, was a liar. Jacob was a thief. Moses, the one who led the Hebrews out of Egypt, from the bondage of Pharaoh to the promised land, 
had a murderous temper. King David, perhaps Israel's greatest monarch, was an adulterer. Heroes of the faith, every single one of them, but the pages of the scriptures refuse to gloss over their shortcomings. It shows them warts and all, and that helps me knowing how imperfect I am. And so it is with Elijah, the person in our story today, whom we encounter in this passage. Elijah, one of the spiritual giants of the Old Testament. Now, to briefly recount the background in today's text, before today's text occurred, three years before, Elijah had stood up for God when idolatry was sweeping through the land of Israel. To please Queen Jezebel, King Ahab had set up altars to the pagan god Baal all over Israel. And the queen had murdered all the prophets of God except Elijah who went into hiding. And because of the nation's unfaithfulness, God's, God caused a terrible drought throughout the land. Famine descended on the population, and it was a dire time. And when the time was right, Elijah came out of seclusion to demonstrate the power of the one true God. Now, perhaps you can recall from your days in Sunday school, a contest was arranged on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal to determine once and for all just who was the real God of Israel. Each would build an altar for their God, and then a sacrifice would be made. The God who answered by fire, consuming the sacrifice, would be the winner. So all day long, the pagan prophets of Baal, they danced and they prayed, they sang and they prayed, they whined and they prayed, all with no result, whatever. No fire, no sacrifice. And finally, at the end of the day, Elijah prayed his relatively short prayer, God of Elijah, send the fire. And God answered by sending the fire, big time. Jehovah had won, Elijah had won. And now that the prophets of Baal had been exterminated and the rains came once more, and except for the very real threat of retribution from Jezebel, Elijah should have been on top of the world. He'd won. He'd shown who the true God of Israel was. But far from it, far from it. Great prophet that he was, he was at the very end of his tether. The most wicked queen, Jezebel, with all the wrath of Bet Davis, Queen Jezebel was after him. No wonder Elijah was too pooped to party. The man who'd faced a thousand pagan priests, the man who dared the hatred of a royal court, now trembled before the threat of one woman, Jezebel. And so what did he do? He went out into the wilderness, out to the desert, and we're told that he sat under the broom tree, the juniper tree, and prayed that God would take his life. Take, oh Lord, let me die, he said, let me die. Elijah was a beaten, defeated man, physically, mentally exhausted. He'd had enough. Now, I think that that Elijah story is very relevant today because we have people, people here, people all over, who are sitting beneath their juniper trees. They've suffered loss, loss of a spouse, perhaps through separation, divorce. And no matter how you slice it, Divorce is lousy, as anybody who has been through it knows. Lousy in the people involved, and the family. Or perhaps lost through death. All of a sudden, you're a widow, you're a widower. Or there's an illness, there's a grief. Or there's a disappointment, or a profound hurt from a member of your family, or someone whom you consider a very close friend. Or maybe there's been something you've been struggling with for years, an addiction perhaps. And the story of Elijah comes along and invites us to enter life and to engage in life once more. I've had it, said Elijah. I'm burned up. I'm burnt out. I've had enough. Now, one might have expected within the pages of the scriptures that the Lord would have responded with something like, there, there, Elijah, chill, chill out. It's all right. You're doing an excellent job. You've done an excellent job by defeating the prophets of Baal. Don't be so depressed. It'll all work out in the end. But God doesn't say that. God doesn't say anything. Just complete silence. And I can visualize the prophet, the great prophet of God, Elijah, sitting there. The juniper tree he was leaning against. The pale blue desert sky. 
Is anybody there? Does anybody care? There might be somebody listening today who's at that point. You've lost your vision. You're ready to give up. To give up your goals. To, you're so emotionally, spiritually, physically drained that you're ready to throw in the towel and pack it all in. You've bottomed out. Not only do you not know where to turn, you don't know, have any notion whatever of turning. You're tired, you're run down, you're listless. That was Elijah, the great man of God, the hero of the faith, defeated, depressed, and dejected. He'd been God's commander in the great victory of Mount Carmel, but now here he was in the pit of depression. Depression's a terrible thing. We all know that Winston Churchill suffered from it. He called it his black dog, and every so often it would take the feet from him. What caused you such depression? Now, if the story of Elijah is instructive, a good part of the answer is sheer frustration. Sheer frustration. I've seen colleagues in this presbytery, excellent ministers, faithful servants of the gospel, so frustrated because they have given themselves unremittingly to the congregation and the parish, preaching, teaching, encouraging, comforting, enabling, and they go along to a Kirk session meeting or a presbytery meeting, and they see and hear people acting absolutely contrary to everything they've been trying to preach and teach, and they wonder whether or not they've made any difference in anyone's life. I've witnessed parents all during my ministry, good fathers, good mothers, loving fathers, loving mothers, giving the best possible upbringing to their children, to their families, but they're now crazy with worry because their teenage son has been arrested for selling drugs or their teenage daughter has gone off with a married man. I've seen a wife sitting quietly by, unable to do anything while her husband, a much-loved GP, slowly wastes away the victim of the inexorable advance of motor neuron disease. Diagnosed and 18 months later, gone. I've seen marriages that have begun with such promise and excitement and they're now drifted into endless days of boredom as the couple become further and further apart. I've seen church members who are so active, so involved, and they've taken umbrage at a casual remark, spoken in jest, and they don't darken the door of the kirk again. Oh, Elijah, oh, Elijah, we hear your calling indeed. And God's response to Elijah's plea was to leave him a piece of cake. A piece of bread. Yes, you heard me correctly. Not once, but twice. And we're told an angel did it. Now, I don't think that that angel in the story had wings somehow. Not this one. Although that kind of angel could have been sent by God. Somehow or other, in the story, I think the angel was a woman living in a wee cottage nearby who came out in the morning to go on with her daily duties and she found a man exhausted and worn out under the juniper tree fast asleep. You know what she did? You know what she did? She put the kettle on. Yes, putting the kettle on has everything to do with holiness. Don't despise it ever. Well, it wasn't exactly a kettle, it was a pitcher of water. And I think she put the griddle on because she baked some bread, she baked a cake on the coals. Thank God for that kind of ministry. The cup of tea, the scone, the chat. This is the word of encouragement and cheer to many ladies in the church who often feel that their ministry is quite different from Elijah's. Never think that your ministry, ladies, in doing these things is not valued. Well, it took an angel to bake a cake to get this great man of God on his feet again. Yes, you wouldn't think that two nights sound sleep and some nourishment could change a man, but it certainly did in this case. And that meaning became clear to Elijah when he'd eaten and drunk and had a good night's sleep. Life was good again. Now, most of you know that the Latin word for bread is panis. And the Latin word for with is cum. And when you combine cum and panis, you get our English word companion with that. Cum panis, companion. A cum panis, a companion, is someone who breaks bread with you, someone who's there for you, someone who's at your side when the going's hard. And this story of Elijah is a forceful reminder that our God is not a magic God who waves a wand and gives you an instant solution and takes away all your problems and all your concerns. The story of Elijah is of a God who gives strength and companionship to deal with life 
not necessarily solutions. When you and I know there is someone there for us, then you and I can cope with much more than we can ever imagine. When you know there's somebody holding your hand as you're about to go th wheel through those doors marked no admission into the operating theatre, when you know there's somebody there to put an arm around your shoulder when your heart is breaking and your eyes are known tears, when you realise that you're not alone to face up to your depression, your problems, your heartache, then that puts strength into you and keeps you on your feet. Your companion, your companion, the one who comes and stands at your side, is something we all need. The fellowship of God and the fellowship of others. Years ago, I remember old Mrs. Crawford, she was a resident in Blair Lodge Nursing Home, it's no longer there, on Racecourse Road in Air. Mrs. Crawford, I remember one day I went in to see her, just before Christmas one year, and she said, Fraser, take me home. I said, I can't take you home, Mrs. Crawford, it's more than my job and my life's work. She said, take me home. I said, Mrs. Crawford, I can't. She said, you're the only minister who's never done what I've told them in the past years before. I said, well, I still can't take you home. But I remember one day when I was visiting her, she said, Fraser, I don't want to die all alone. Loneliness is endemic in 21st century Scotland. I wonder if you saw the news item in the BBC News this past week of Glenn Michael, the television personality, and now in his 90s, he's facing terrible loneliness. Now, I'm convinced that a great deal of the loneliness in Scotland today it's to do with the fact that so many folk don't have a live church connection. Because the church is a place where lonely people can find friendship. So God comes to us in this story and says, I leave you bread. I leave this companion, this companion to tell you, Elijah. I'm telling you, Elijah, that I'm not going to do away instantly with Queen Jezebel. I'm not going to do away with all your other problems that you're carrying in your heart. But I'm here to tell you that I'll be with you. I'll be your companion to give you strength and ultimately to make all things new again. I'm not here to take away your problems, Elijah. I'm here to carry them with you. Friends, we have not power to take away all the problems of our families and friends and those around us in the fellowship of the church. But we have the power, the incredible power, to pray for them and to be with them. I wonder if you know the name of the Reverend Henry Francis Light. Henry Francis Light was vicar of Brixham in the mid-19th century. Brixham, the fishing fort, port just along the coast from Torquay in Devon. Henry Francis Light, he was born in Kelso, he was a Scotsman. He was much loved by his parishioners. He was a really good and godly man who knew his people so well. And he did a wonderful thing during his ministry in Brixham. He organised a Bible be placed in every fishing boat in the port. Now, Henry Francis Light became an ill man in his 50s, and his doctors told him that he would need to go to a warmer and a drier climate. So he resigned his parish, and he planned to set off for the continent. And before he left, he sat in his little garden in the vicarage, looking back in his ministry, thinking of the most recent years, which hadn't been too good because of his sickness. Several folk had left his church and gone elsewhere. Some members were fighting amongst themselves. And yet, in spite of all that, he thought of all the good things and measured them out. And he wrote a hymn for his people, probably the one of the best loved hymns in the English language. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. A hymn that's brought comfort and assurance to millions ever since. And if you go down to Brixham today, every night at eight o'clock, the church bells and Henry Francis Light's little church Play that hymn. And three years ago, when I was holidaying with friends in Nice, I went to the little Anglican church in Nice and found the grave of Henry Francis Light and paid homage there, the man who bequeathed this gem to the world. He knew the companionship of God. Friends, it's not always answers that we need. And sometimes, sometimes I suspect it's not always answers that we want. I think all of us, knowing the restrictions of our human existence, simply want a companion to be with us. This is what our God is all about. Companionship. Otherwise, you have people walking through life hurting, not because they're oppressed by the unfairness and the poverty of life, but because they have no one who is a companion. Friends, within the life of every congregation of God's people, our remit 
is to be companions to one another on life's road. It's as simple as that. Translated, that means that this week there is someone you can call. There is someone who is unwell and you can send a card. There's someone who's lonely and you can knock the door and say, hello, how are you getting on? There's someone who's angry and hurting that you can touch. There's someone who's depressed and hurt that you can go and sit with. Companion. In other words, if we're going to live the Christian life to the full, the story of Elijah from the Old Testament, that hero of the faith who faced depression and dejection and despondency, he found newness of life when he found the companionship of the lady who came and gave him hospitality and the God who was there for him. And so you and I are called simply to be present, to be Christ-like, to be bread, to be nourishment, to be companions to others. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed all honor and glory as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We sing together the hymn, Mission Praise 115, Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. Let us pray. Listening, loving God, companion of our road, source of love and goodness, we thank you that in this house of prayer, where we break bread together in Jesus' name, where we gather as your family, 
Your Spirit rejuvenates us to work in harmony and compassion and never to despair. We thank you, Lord, that you have entrusted us to bring your truth to a world filled with lies, to bring your light to a world stumbling in darkness, to bring your hope to a world reeling in tragedy, to bring your love to a world mired in hatred. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the companions of our road, those whom you've given to us to put a song in our heart, a smile on our lips, and a spring in our step, families and friends, neighbors and colleagues who are there to support us when the going gets tough, when we come to the end of our tether. Lord, nature roars around us in fire and flood in places far and near, shattering communities, uprooting lives. Sickness and infirmity take us by surprise and we feel lost and scared. In this maze of life, we often don't know which way to turn. Guide us, O oh God, that we may be aware of how we can be there for others, holding out a hand to help, sending a check to alleviate suffering, writing a letter to challenge politicians to action. Be pleased to bless Elizabeth, our Queen, and all who in authority over us. And as she holidays at Balmoral, grant to her peace and tranquility that she may find strength and health to fulfill her public duties. Be pleased to bless the Church of Scotland in these anxious days as we plan with faith for the future of the Church in our cities, our towns, and our villages in the years to come. Be pleased to bless all whom we know, whom in the quietness we name before you. Acknowledging that all that we have is yours, so accept the money which we've brought this day, tokens of our love, tokens of our commitment to the cause of Jesus in this town and across the world. And Father of Spirits, with gratitude, we recall those who witness for the faith down the years, and especially those of this congregation and of our own hearth and home, now entered into their eternal rest. As we struggle to hand on the torch of faith to those who come after us, give us the firm assurance that at the last, when we say our farewells to this world, we will inherit that everlasting kingdom of love and light, Jerusalem the golden, with milk and honey blessed. And to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be ascribed all majesty and power, now and forever. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we take upon our lips his precious words. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our last hymn, I always associate the Salvation Army, because I heard it years and years ago when I was a student, and it was a Salvation Army band who played it. Alan, you'll do just as good a job as, you, as we sing together the, the hymn from Mission Praise 672. There is a name I love to hear. Oh, how I love the Savior's name, the sweetest name on earth. <laughs>
go with us, Lord, into all our tomorrows. May we be companions to each other on life's road. And may we know your companionship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit each step of the way. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you and all those whom you love, both near and far, this day and forevermore. Amen.